let's uh, go sincerely, boldly, before the throne of grace. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we bless you for your eternal presence. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence uh, and, and worship because of Calvary. We thank you that you would welcome us to come boldly and sincerely. We do that, Lord, and that we come humbly. Uh, we're amazed that you love us so, so much that you've set your heart on allowing us to begin to know you, uh, to share life in Christ, that we might have life and have it more abundantly, the gift of eternal life, and how that is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our, who is our life. And Lord, we, we bless you for becoming sin, that we might possess your righteousness. And we thank you for being the cornerstone of the church, uh, the rock of ages. Our rock and our refuge, our strength, our fortress, our deliverer, uh, the God in whom we trust. Uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We thank you for making yourself known. We thank you for revealing yourself in Holy Scripture. And Lord, today as we gather, that you would, through the power of your Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our heart, and that we might see Christ, that we might know that we pray with you. Uh, that you would touch our hearts, Lord, and that you would melt them and uh, continue to use this time to conform them uh, to your image. Uh, our attitudes, uh, our behaviors, our disposition, uh, all that we are, Lord, we pray that you would conform us to your image. Father, we think of those in our congregation who uh, need encouragement, uh, who are downcast apart. You know who they are. And you're the God of hope. We pray that you would stir uh, the hope that they have in their heart. We pray that you would lift that down, downcast spirit, any depression, any discouragement. Uh, and may you lift that Lord as they focus their eyes on you. <clears throat> also, Father, too, uh, we think of uh, those who are still afraid to come out, uh, and all that goes with that. We pray that you would continue to work in through this time, uh, that you would bring our society and um, all that is happening right now back to what uh, we would consider to be a normal state.
we thank you that you know our hearts completely. You know all there is to know about us. I thank you that you even know the prayers uttered before we lift them up. And uh, I pray all these prayers were in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that they will be in accordance with your will. And we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for that. Also, Father, to uh, thank you for uh, the milestone that God has had you reach. Uh, thank you for the blessings that they've been to our church family and to their loved ones and extended family and friends. And we pray that you would grant them great, great peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. It's from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. By completely humble and gentle, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of might of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak for our hearts and that you would give us insight into the scripture before us and in the circumstances and in the world around us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, this morning I wanted to uh, talk to you about the blessings of unity. And it's a timely message for what's been going on in our country. Um, I thought we were pretty much getting over the riots and the social unrest, and I guess it started again last night with another unfortunate incident, which I know none of the details about. But um, the message of the blessings of unity is, is timeless, given what's going on there. And then if you step back a little bit politically, uh, the discourse has been nothing but bickering and division for a very long time now, right? And I cannot help but think of what Jesus said. A house divided against itself cannot stand. In fact, I understand that those words are plastered someplace in the halls of Congress. They ought to do well to take note of that. So I don't want to tell you how bad it, I'm not going to tell you how bad it's been lately, and I know that it would get much worse, but let me... Let me give you a little perspective. Let's put this in perspective. So I, I took my car to the garage the other day, and I'm talking to, you know, like the service manager, right? And he was telling me, because we were talking about the craziness and everything that's going on, and he was telling me about a conversation that he had with his 97-year-old grandma. And she said to him, I've never seen anything like this in all my years. She talked about how she went through the Great Depression, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the social unrest, and everything since then. And she says, I've never, ever seen anything like this before. Now, folks, that is a perspective of one person. I understand that. But it's a 97-year-old perspective. That ought to give us pause. I can't agree with her more. Between the coronavirus control, and I don't use that word lightly, control, because that's what it is, to anarchists controlling parts of the city of Seattle, to the mayors and governors Democratic or politician. The Democrats are going against the Democrats now. To the presidents and the mayors being at odds. 
to the governors and the president being at odds. Did I say presidents? Presidents, one president. <laughs> Heaven forbid we get to that one. And then the political parties being at odds. Do they know what they're doing? It's like playing with matches near tanks of gunpowder. Let me also suggest that there are demonic forces at work. Devils at work, ripping at the fabric of our society through unsaved people. There are nefarious human forces that identify with the enemy. They don't have God. They just want chaos. They want to bring the system down. There are groups and nation states working together to foment the unrest, using race, using class warfare. It's sad. Jesus didn't see any of that. Level playing field, rich or poor, slave or free, black or white, brown, didn't matter to him. He didn't see any of that. Now, why is this happening? Besides the demonic forces, but let's, let's put it in perspective. Our leaders have left God out. That's why it's happening. And I'm talking about leaders in general. I'm not talking about just the Democrats or just the Republicans. I'm talking about our leaders. We elect leaders who leave God. So what do you expect? We're finally reaping what we've sown. You know, God is not mocked. Amen? I mentioned all this to a family member earlier in the week. You know, now I was brought up Catholic, of course. You know, the worst thing is you become a Baptist minister, right? <laughs> Not really. You know, I think when people got to know my wife, they thought, oh, he's not that crazy after all, but she's not crazy. <laughs> but after I mentioned about leaving God out, they said amen. They almost fell onto the floor. And then I said, let's have a word of prayer. And they said, yeah, let's. We had a word of prayer. And then they, when we are done with it, said, they said amen. It's like, this is really great. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor, how are our leaders leaving God out? I mean, I hear them stand up and they give a speech and they talk and they, and they say, God bless America. How are they leaving God out? Well, if you go into the Old Testament, you see a lot of people invoking the name of God who they have made in their own image. They've called upon a God that they've reduced to what they can manage. I can't help but think of, uh, you know, Elijah and Mount Carmel, you know, how they're dancing all day and trying to do the, the boogie dance and trying to call fire down. They're invoking God's blessing. It's, it's empty. This is how you tell a politician whether they're with God or against God. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. Watch what they do. Assess their policies. Does it line up with the Word of God? I look at both sides of the aisle, some a little bit more so than others. But not consistently, not completely. Words are meaningless with a politician. Watch what they do. Now, before I get to the Ephesians passage, I'm going to briefly comment on Psalm 133. I can't not comment on the psalm. This is a wonderful and beautiful psalm. It's short. It's something to get our arms around. But I love the spiritual picture and principle it presents. The blessings of unity from Mount Hermon, which would be in the north, to Mount Zion, Jerusalem. From north to south in Israel, you got this picture of God's anointing, holy oil, running down the high priest who is typifies Christ. 
Down his beard and down his robe, from top to bottom, from head to toe, so to speak, the blessings of unity. Because God's Spirit is in it. Oh, I just absolutely love that song. Likened to the dew coming down upon the mountains, just like God watering it. What a precious and pleasant picture. And you know, as, as I was reflecting on this again, I couldn't help. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you had that kind of unity in our throughout the world, in our country, in our communities, at our places of work, in our families? Oh my goodness! Can you imagine the blessings, the untold blessings? Let me give you a real quick background on, on Psalm 133. To Psalm of David. He wrote it during a time where, by God's grace, he was unifying Israel. This is a song of ascent as they went up to Jerusalem to worship. They would sing the song, and it would echo throughout the city streets and into the temple courts. Harmony, melody, peace, calm, strength, all that just coming right off their lips. You get the picture, right? And yet, tragically, after the deaths of David and Saul, it all came crashing down. The nation descended into chaos. The exact opposite of the picture of that's put forth in Psalm 133 that David wrote. Israel was no longer one. It was divided between north and south. There was civil war. So, you know, I, I look at all this and I say, you know, I look at our time, the craziness of it. How, how do we respond to all this? I was talking to someone the other day. I said, hey, you see the news? They go, oh, I don't even watch the news. I'm thinking, I think that's called what psychologists would say as avoidance. You know, you ever just not want to deal with something or somebody or a situation? You kind of bury it. They call it avoidance, right? So uh, I'm going to ask the question, how, how do you respond to situations? Like, how, do you, how do you deal with contentious situations? Yeah, I, I grew up, I said this before, I grew up in a contentious home, you know? I go running into the fray. You know, I haven't learned generally how to avoid it. And that can be a blessing and curse, I suppose. But what do people do? They manage it the same way, as this person said to me the other day. They avoid it. We, why do we avoid it? Because we would like nothing more than to not have to deal with contention. Nobody wants to deal with discord and strife and contention. Amen? Do you want to deal with it? I don't want to deal with it. And yet the problem is it's not living in a real world. Yet you have to deal with it at some point. Or you don't really have a viable relationship. So this is the way I see it. You have two options, it's pretty simple. The option is seeking peace and calm and serenity in relationships. That's the first option. The second option is promoting discord, unrest, strife, which leads to more troubled waters. Now, I know what my blood pressure would choose. I know what my heart and mind would choose. The peace, the calm, the serenity. That's what I would want. I know that's what you would want too, right? You don't have to be a road scholar to figure it out. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Here, we're going to break this down, actually, give you a structure of the book real quick. Chapters 1 through 3 because we've looked at some of these passages of Scripture. Chapters 1 through 3 is all doctrinal. Doctrinal as in how we understand uh, the Christian life, what God has called us to, what the church is. Chapters 4 through 6 is kind of where the rubber meets the road. It's very, very practical, right? This is what I want you to notice. After Paul is done all the doctrinal, take a look at what he talks about. 
unity. Now, why, why is that? Why does he start with the subject of unity? Because Paul could have started with a lot of different topics. Why? Don't miss this. To start with unity is to start with God. And let me demonstrate that. Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. Deuteronomy 6 4. The number one in Scripture is representative of unity. Unity and the number one are representative of God. Paul, in a sense, starts with what God promotes when we walk with him. E.W. Bullinger, a 19th century Anglican scholar in a book entitled Number in Scripture, wrote this, quote, there can be no doubt as to the significance of this primary number. One denotes unity and primacy. So with the deity, it marks the beginning. We must begin with God. Nothing is right that does not begin with them. God first is the great proclamation. Paul starts with unity because unity starts with God. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Numero uno, of number one importance. And when we don't, this is why we have what we have. So, in other words, if you want unity, in relationships and in your family and in places of work and in our country, you have to start with God. God has to get the same. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and chapter 4, you see the great contrast. Peace, calm, paradise, being in unison with God, and then they sin, and then you have this chaotic mess in Genesis 4. Killing, and all sorts of other stuff. The devil gets in there, sin gets in there, and it becomes a mess. And yet, praise God, he hasn't left us in this mess. The gospel restores this unity, this reconciliation that we preach. And I don't have to tell you this, you know this. You've heard it before. Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the answer to everything. Everything. So when we read this section here in Ephesians chapter 4, and I don't, we don't want to miss this here, Paul's personal appeal for unity says, uh, Therefore, I entreat you to walk worthy of the manner of calling. And he goes on to say in verse 3, uh, Be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. What we don't want to lose sight of here is the need for God to be at the center. You can pursue unity and be diligent in that, but if God is not at your center, you don't have it. There's no peace, there's no harmony, there's no security unless God is front and center. That's what Scripture teaches. But we can talk about common values, we can talk about shared values. We can talk about philosophical and human values. We can talk about the doctrine, all that, right, of being good and kind and nice. And it's all going to come down if we leave God. It's inevitable. It happens. Now, this passage in, in Ephesians 4 is directed to the church. I think you know that. But the principles... The relational principles still work outside these walls of being, you know, humble and patient and um, and gentle relationally. It works. Now let's bring this uh, passage down here. Verses one through three. I'm just going to dub it as the calling and the attitude part. Verses four through six, the divine community part. You know, when you use the word community, you have the word unity in it, right? But the calling part and attitude part and the divine community part. Let's talk about the calling and the attitude part. So I know this guy years ago, what he did for a living was hang drywall. And he did it well. He would hang it 
and he would finish it I, I, like no one else could. He just did a great, great job. And he would always joke, he was very, very tall, I guess he still is, I haven't seen him for a long time. Tall, but you know, he would joke and he would say, I was born for this. That's what he would say. Right? Had a great attitude, great work ethic, always jovial, loved to go to work, just excelled at what he did, right? All brings calling and attitude together to excel. And we're encouraged and we're challenged to live up to what God has called us to do one day. Now, this person. I don't know if they know the Lord or not, but they had a great perspective with what they were called to do in their life, and a great work, great attitude from day to day with how they approached it. And as uh, as believers, surely we can muster that and bring that to the table. Now, and I want you to think about it. What is this calling? God has called us to Himself, right? That's the calling. We are saved. We're the church. Last week we talked about how the church is a divine witness to his glory. And you may not see that as you look at people here, but all of us are divine witnesses of his glory. And we're called to walk in the manner of Christ's calling. We were born for this. That's why we were born again for this. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's so, that's so precious. Christ is our life. We've been called to him. We've been called to him. Now, before I get to the um, attitude part, uh, when Paul says uh, to walk in a worthy manner, here's, here's the problem. None of us are worthy, right? I'm not worthy, you're not worthy. But the gospel is very clear. Christ has made us worthy through the blood of Christ, right? We are, we've been made worthy, not in and of ourselves, but we've been made worthy to walk in a worthy manner. Remember we talked about how in Ephesians 1 through 3, Paul talks about how God raised us. We're seated, we're justified, we're glorified, we're sanctified in Christ. He's made us worthy. And, and so we're called to live up to tremendously high standards. And, and I'm telling you, I was saying to my wife last night, boy, do I fail. I fail miserably. What is the key? The only way we can do this is to walk in the spirit. We're either in the flesh or we're in the spirit. It's one or the other. Either the flesh comes out or the spirit comes out. Now listen to what Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 16. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So when I have a bad moment, that's the flesh. It's not the spirit. And that's because I'm not keeping God front and center. And, and it, you know, it's sometimes almost like a toggle switch, you know, back and forth, up and down, right? But I want you to understand that Christ has made us worthy, and therefore we're, we're called to keep him front and center, and we do that by the tools he's given us. I mean, this is where the attitude comes in. It's a call to attitude. Notice in verse 2 here, the, the three qualities, humility, gentleness, patience. Uh, you know, that, that's hard. That's real hard, right? Humility, patience, gentleness. And women might have a little bit more of a handle on that than some, some of the guys, right? But this is what I, this is what I, it, God's laid upon. Think about those qualities. That's the disposition of God toward you and me. Humble, right? Gentle, patient. He's been consistently like that with me. That's his mindset. And that mindset 
relationally produces unity. And when we don't have that mindset, lots of friction. Now here's the other thing I want you to notice too. Take a look in verse 2 at the word forbearance or forbearing. It's actually been translated more recently as tolerance. Now, you've heard the word tolerance before. You've heard about being tolerant, right? Let's talk about that. Um, but first, um, this word in the Greek, uh, it's a great word because it speaks to the quality of the person to hold back, to remain upright, and to overlook the shortcomings of somebody else. You know, love covers all to the sense, right? It's overlooking the shortcomings or mistakes. It's different from long suffering. Long suffering is when somebody hurts me, I don't lash down. But forbearance is where I look beyond the shortcomings of another person. Right? <coughs> but this is what it is also not. It doesn't mean that you embrace those shortcomings or errors, right? And yet here's the problem in our culture. We've made the word tolerance to be something other than what God means in Scripture or forbearance. The word tolerance, like the word gay, has been hijacked. So tolerance now culturally means I not only have to accept, but I have to embrace and I have to sanction what the peer pressure groups want from a person in society. That's what it means. It's group think mentality. You have to think like we think, you have to say like we do, and you have to do like we do. That's what tolerance means. So, Ironically, there's no tolerance when people take that position. Regardless of whether it's right or wrong, despite it not being biblical, culture of tolerance is not forbearing. It doesn't overlook a fault or error. It says, you have to be like me. That's what it says. And so it's forcing people to conform and to be uniform in everything. Folks, that's not going to produce unity. Never has, never will. So this is what cultural tolerance looks today like today. It's calling good evil and evil good. You can't speak truth today, or you're a bigot. Right? Can't do it. This is a very, very important truth that I'm going to say here. Unity is not conformity or uniformity. That's not biblical. Unity is found in God, and God embraces diversity. Does he not? You're not going to make everyone like a cookie cutter approach. That's going to be like matches near the power keg. Not going to happen. If you take a look, verses four through six points this out. You've got you've got a body. You got many members, various parts. You got lots of diversity in the body, in the body of Christ, but in your own physical body. But when you eliminate diversity, everything's going to fall apart. If I were to make your body all eyes, what would that do for you? You wouldn't exist. You'd come apart. God embraces diversity. We see this in the Godhead. God is one. And yet the functions of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit 
are different redemptively into the plan of salvation. They have different roles, and yet they're perfectly in sync with what they do. We see this concept of unity diversity as just mentioned in the volume. All, but all the parts, all the individual parts, have their role and they're intended to what? Function for the good of the whole. You, you start forcing conformity and uniformity, society's going to die. It's going to come apart. If you were to read on from verses, and I don't know where the Lord's taking me next week, but if you read on from verses 7 through 16 of chapter 4, Paul develops the thought of diversity with many various gifts in the body. That's, God embraces diversity. Conformity and uniformity is a curse. It destroys the very concept of unity. E pluribus unum, look at the United States. Many but one. Look at the strength of that. I always say, you know what? Two minds are better than one, three are better than two. Right? Can. It's the strength of the United States. Many but one. So when we understand the blessings of unity, it starts with God. It's God first. And when this happens, you have the unity of the Spirit. It's kept. And it flows through the church. And hopefully, it, with the analogy, it runs out into the community. And it's, it's great blessing and water. Just kind of like the, the oil that runs down from Aaron's beard and onto the grove. And where you go as a light for God, with Him front and center, you promote the unity of the Spirit in the bottom of the church. So, you may say, well, Pastor, I don't see the unity in the church today. Don't be fooled. The unity's there. What did Jesus say? You shall know the Bible fruits. What you see physically in all the divisions, don't be fooled. You'll know the Bible fruits. Right? One final thought. The movements that we see today. The movement in the world toward one world order, conformity and uniformity, it's not of God. Especially when you start to see policies that are godless, that are promoted, and take away your freedoms. They're not of God. That's not of God. That whole global thing, don't buy into it, it's not of God. It'll lead to Antichrist. Secondly, the movement in our country towards socialism. If you haven't noticed it already, okay, dependence upon government. This is not of God. It's not of God. You know, when we started this whole coronavirus thing, right, what did I say? God or government? Who do you want to put your trust in? Socialism is an economic form of communism. And if you get a socialistic system, they're going to control you economically. When they control you economically, they've got total control. That's not of God. Communism is statism. Statism is the state's first. It's not God first, it's the state that's first. You see this in communist countries, China, Russia, etc., etc. God's not in the picture. In fact, if you've taken a look at our country and our move from self-reliance and dependency upon God to statism, God's been pushed out. And that's why we have what we have. This total mess. The movement in Seattle. Uh, this is absolutely amazing. Um, I don't even still know. I haven't really read up on the situation the last couple of days. You've got a mayor that doesn't want to do anything. You've got a police chief that wants to do something. 
you got a president that wants to do something. I'm not even sure where the governor is in that whole thing. Okay. But if you notice, all the places that are in crisis are in the places where you have liberals who have embraced statism. Now, that situation in Seattle, it's not of God, it's anarchy. Anarchists are fascists. They push the doctrine of uniformity and conformity. That's what they do. You have to be and think and do like me or off with your head. That's the way it is. Uh, do you want to live in that kind of environment? I don't. I want people to help me see better and think better and be a better person. I said to my wife, that's why God gave me care. <laughs> the fascist movement will crush any dissent. And it will never ever leave the unity because God's not in their program. It's devoid of the spirit of God. It's demonic. God's been left out. He's not front and center. The state is front and center. And there's always going to be your PC police, you know, the fascist machine that will disagree with something. They always find something to disagree with, don't they? I mean, you can't, you, you can't even call things by the right name anymore. I mean, I live in a country where it's freedom of speech, right? Do you think after a while that I'll continue to speak like, be able to speak like this? Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. I'm not sure how I handle this with everything that's going on. So I'm going to bury the head sometimes, the avoidance thing. But it's like, you know, that's like another world over there, isn't it? This is the United States of America. The last time I checked, I had the freedom, First Amendment, freedom of religion and, and speech, right? And a lot of other freedoms that the Constitution affords. And yet you have a bunch of people standing out there with a bunch of guns and forcing and not allowing the police to come in. I'll tell you how I would handle that. And it wouldn't end well for those people. And somebody needs to have some leadership and some morals and some guts. By the way, did I, did I, I think I mentioned this to you, right? The fascists. Their primary objective, leave God. And when that happens, they're coming for you. You, 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 and you. I, I don't have enough time to say that any of to this one. But they're coming for you. So this is what I would say to all of us as I close. Buckle up. Hold fast to your relationship in Christ. Hold fast to what we have here in this fellowship. We have a very, very blessed church. We've got great elders, great men of God, great saints here that love God and seek to preserve the unity of the Spirit and bond of peace. Hold on to that. Because His blessing, this blessing will go a long way as it continues to unravel. Because I tell you, brothers and sisters, I take a look at this. It's unraveling, and it's unraveling fast, very, very fast. Like that 97-year-old lady, God bless her, 97. 97-year-old lady, like her perspective, I've never, ever, ever seen anything like this before. Because God's been that way. That's what the Lord has laid upon my heart this morning. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, sin is a disgrace to any nation and to ourselves as well. And Father, we uh, pray that you would forgive us for the sins of our nation. Um, top to bottom, Lord, I can't even begin to list all of the sins and uh, how we've walked away from you. We 
ask and pray that you would forgive us and by your good graces, uh, if it be your will, if you be pleased to do so, that you would restore unity in our country, um, that you would uh, deal with the forces that seek to create division, uh, class warfare and uh, race warfare. Uh, and diversity warfare. We pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would grace our churches, uh, those that uh, preach Christ and present Christ in truth, that you would grace them with great, great unity. Uh, Father, thank you for the unity that we have here, uh, the blessings um, of uh, that anointing that runs throughout this fellowship. Thank you for that. Thank you for each part, each person that has a part in that. I pray for um, the blessings of your unity to extend to families in this church and extended families uh, that we would be a beacon of light that you would use us in a way uh, to promote Folks are closing him number four twenty nine. Four twenty nine. 